much for the very nice introduction. Let me just, so first off, um, I was just working on trying to get the slides out to, to people so that you can follow independently if you'd like. Um, unfortunately, the PDF is quite large um, and so I can't drop it in the chat. So I sent it to Marvin uh, and hopefully Marvin, you receive it any second now and can send it out to people. Um, and hopefully you have access. So anyways, if there's a real issue there, let me know and we can try to get it figured out. <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, okay, good. Okay, great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> last thing I need to do here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the acquisition of non-canonical clause type-to-speech act mappings in preschoolers and also um, canonical mappings in infants. <clears throat> this is joint work with several people here at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm going to tell you about a couple of experiments that we have run in our running in Jeff Lidz's lab in collaboration with Jeff and Valentin Eckar and also Jad Webe, who is currently a PhD student at MIT. Um, and also heavily involved in the project is Yuan Yang, who is a um, fifth year PhD student at the University of Maryland. Um, she is not involved directly with the experiments I'm gonna tell you about, um, but she's involved with other experiments and also working on the input and doing some modeling. And um, so uh, heavily involved as well. <clears throat> okay, so um, there are many different kinds of speech acts that uh, we can perform in speaking, but it seems that three of them are, are privileged uh, linguistically and also cross-linguistically. So cross-linguistically, there are three main clause types that are linked to three main speech acts. And I'm thinking here of declarative clauses uh, linked to assertions, interrogative clauses linked to questions, and um, imperative clauses linked to requests. Um, our, our broad question is when and how do children acquire these links? And also when and how do they acquire um, violations of these links, which I'll get into in a second. There are a couple of complications in this acquisition task. One is for acquiring the canonical links, um, and that's that the clause type forms can vary greatly from language to language. So it's not the case the child can be born um, with an expectation that declarative clauses look one way and interrogative clauses look another way, since, of course, interrogative clauses, for example, are marked differently cross linguistically, as we see with the examples in the table here. I'm not going to go through the, the table directly. Um, I think the complication is quite clear. Um, and then a second complication is that the canonical links that I pointed out on the, that first slide are violated. Um, so to take a classic example in four of indirect requests, here we have a polar interrogative, can you put zebra in the school, which is known to be used to convey um, a request rather than a question about the addressee's abilities. Um, another classic example, also, well, more recent sort of classic example is rise in declarative in five. So here we have a declarative clause, Ziva works at the school with um, the intonation that's typical of a polar question in English. And this declarative clause is used to ask a special kind of question. Okay, so as I mentioned briefly before, we have two overarching research questions, when and how do children figure out the canonical links and when and how do they figure out that these links can be violated. I'm gonna be focused uh, in most of this talk on the when part of these questions. Um, but I wanna talk just briefly about the how question and some ideas that we have about um, how to answer those questions from sort of a bird's eye view. Um, so if you think about it from the child perspective, um, it, it, it seems like a, quite a challenge, right? Um, if you sort of come into the situation not already knowing one half, say knowing what speech act speakers are uttering every, uh, every time they speak or knowing which clause types they're uttering, uttering every time they speak, then it seems like quite the challenge to figure out this mapping. Um, it's like, uh, how would you figure out the speech act that a speaker's performing with an utterance without knowing um, the clause type that's typically used to perform that particular kind of, of speech act? Um, and to turn that question on its head, how could they figure out uh, the clause types without understanding the, the speech acts speakers are, are saying ahead of time. So um, from the child's perspective, they're hearing all these utterances in the input. On the left-hand side here, we see 
formal information about those utterances and on the right hand side, pragmatic speech act information about those utterances. Um, and they sort of have this, this stew of utterances in the input and, and they're trying to uh, figure out how these things link up with each other. Um, and we, we think that, um, so I mean, not only do, do they have to figure out the, the canonical links um, between the clause types on the left and the speech jacks on the right, they've also got to ignore other syntactic information that's not relevant to figuring out these mappings. So uh, passivization, topicalization, and so on. And on the right-hand side, they need to focus in on just three particular kinds of speech acts. And so the question is, how do they figure out these mappings? And not only that, but then, as I mentioned before, there are these non-canonical uh, links as well. And to them, it's not obvious that the canonical links and the non-canonical links look any different uh, in the input. So the, it's quite a, a complicated picture. And the question is, how does the child do this? And we think what they're doing is they're tracking different kinds of information on both the formal side and the pragmatic side. So starting on the formal side on the left, we think they're tracking information about syntax and prosody. So does, is there a verb that precedes the subject? Is the verb bare? Is there rising intonation? Is there some kind of special functional particle? And then on the pragmatic side on the right, they're tracking information about the speaker's um, information and intentions. So what does the speaker want? What does the speaker know? Uh, and if there's time in the question answer period, there's some further things we could talk about they might be tracking on the pragmatic side here. Um, so we refer to this as the pragmatic syntactic bootstrapping hypothesis. Um, the idea is that they're tracking regularities in both form and speaker intentions in mutually forming ways and sort of building up the, the mappings and then also learning the non-canonical mappings from the way that these, um, these different pieces correlate with one another. I want to... Uh, zoom in on questions and interrogatives. Um, our project has focused in particular on, on questions and interrogatives, in part because we think they pose some special challenges. So thinking from the, the pragmatic side, um, questions are canonically used to seek information. That's of course not the only thing people use questions for, as we well know, um, but it's one of the, the main uses of questions. But Parents can't expect their pre-linguistic children to give informative answers um, to the questions that they ask. Um, so it's likely that many of the questions in the input are pragmatically non-canonical in this sense. So they're questions where the parent already knows uh, the answer to the question and instead they're testing the child or trying to help them learn something. On the formal side, uh, there's a further challenge, which is that it's not obvious that polar and WH interrogatives are unified formally speaking. So in many languages, WH interrogatives and declaratives both have a similar intonational contour, um, usually a falling intonational contour. And uh, uh, polar interrogatives and declaratives in many languages are string identical. Um, so yeah, figuring out that interrogatives are sort of a, a unified class that um, relate to one kind of speech act questionhood um, is made more challenging by these facts. Um, <clears throat> we're also interested in interrogatives because we think that WH questions pose an interesting challenge for the acquisition of basic syntax. So in six and seven, we have um, a few examples of declarative clauses. So in six, Sam made a sandwich, April brought some toys. Um, and one of the things children need to learn about the basic syntax of their language is the transitivity properties of the verbs in the language. Um, and you can see with examples like in seven that um, these verbs differ. So the verb to bring is necessarily transitive. If you try, if you try to take away the object, the result is unacceptable. <clears throat> um, whereas a verb like eight is an, uh, to eat is an alternator, alternating between transitive and intransitive. The, the challenge that WH interrogatives pose here is, is that um, in a language like English, where you have um, the WH pronoun fronted, um, the child might incorrectly um, uh, learn that these verbs are intransitive or at least alternators um, from sentences like the WH interrogatives in eight, right? Because you can't see the, the object um, following the verb uh, in the way that it would in the declarative clause. So there's kind of a, a chicken and the egg, a chicken and egg problem here. Um, 
on the one hand, the, so the child needs to learn about WH dependencies. They need to learn that these WH words are linked to the object posi position for these verbs. Um, but in order to do that, they need to know that the verbs can take an object argument. And to know that, they need to not get confused by sentences like a, in the input, which they, they certainly are in the input. They actually make up about a quarter of input um, to children. Um, <clears throat> So it's, it's a tricky challenge. And one idea um, going back several decades um, is that non-basic clauses like WH interrogatives in eight need to be filtered from the data um, that's used for verb learning. So if you, can, if you can find some way to ignore those, then you won't get tripped up by them. And one possibility is that if children are aware that WH questions are interrogatives and therefore special and not the kind of thing that you want to learn um, uh, transitivity properties from, um, then that might aid them in, in filtering them out for doing this basic syntax acquisition. So that's, um, yeah, one of the many reasons we're interested in sort of figuring out how children figure, uh, acquire these links between um, speech accent clause types. Okay, so as I said before, I'm gonna be focused on the, um, the when questions here. So let's go over a timeline of what we know from prior work about what children know and when they know it. So starting with younger ages on the left, um, on the bottom side of the timeline, we're looking at sort of pragmatic information. So very young before six months, um, children demonstrate that they understand communication. One way they do that is that um, they're more likely to follow an adult's gaze after hearing a, a communicative signal as opposed to a non-communicative signal. Um, by the time that they're 12 months old, they recognize that speech um, communicates whereas other vocal signals do not. So for example, coughing. And in fact, um, Vulamanos et al and Onishi et al, um, they, um, they actually ran the study even with six months olds and found the same effect. Um, they're also aware that they can point to provide information and elicit information by the time they're about 12 months old. And then on the top side of the timeline, on the, the formal side, um, there's some work suggesting that children can formally distinguish subject ox inversion from sentences that lack subject ox inversion by the time they're about 12 months old. So they're, they're able syntactically to recognize the difference that is crucial for acquiring English polar interrogatives. Um, and then by the time they're about 18 to 20 months old, they um, seem to understand, have an adult-like understanding of WH interrogatives. That's from work done in the lab here at the University of Maryland. And by the time they're two years old, they also start to anticipate speaker changes after hearing interrogatives more than after hearing declaratives in a conversation. Um, so the likely explanation for, for this result is, is that children understand the link between interrogatives and questioning. Right? If they understand it as a question, then they're going to expect a speaker change after hearing an interrogative. Um, but there's another sort of deeply skeptical interpretation of these results, which is that um, available, which is that um, children have just acquired sort of a low level correlation between interrogative clauses and speaker changes without actually understanding what interrogative clauses are for. Right? So they've just observed that when you hear an interrogative in the input, speakers change. And so when I hear an interrogative, I'm going to just look to a different speaker at that time. Um, so we think that they really have acquired the link between clause types and speech X by that age. Um, and we'd like to find some evidence that that's in fact the case. We think it's happening in the second year of life and likely before they're even a year and a half old. Um, and uh, so our, our first set of experiments are sort of targeting this age range. Um, looking at the older half of the timeline, um, by the time children are three, they clearly seem to have acquired the canonical links between clause types and speech acts. Um, and by the time they're three and a half and four, um, they also start to exhibit evidence of understanding uh, indirect speech acts performed with attitude verbs like think and want. And so we think that children are at least acquiring non-canonical links between clause types and speech acts by that age. Um, and so I will tell you about an experiment that's sort of targeting this age group with a novel kind of uh, non-canonical link. Okay, so here's the outline for the, the rest of the talk. Uh, in the first part of the remainder, I'm gonna address this question, do preschoolers understand rising declaratives? 
And our experimental results will suggest that they do understand rising declaratives as, as distinct from both falling declaratives and polar interrogatives by the time they're um, three and a half to four and a half years old. And in the, the second part, I will tell you, uh, well, we'll talk about the question, do 18 to 24 month olds understand canonical links between polar interrogatives and questions and following declaratives and assertions. Our data collection here is ongoing. So I only have preliminary results for you, um, but the preliminary results suggest yes, that children at that age um, are demonstrating that they understand these links. And so I'm excited to uh, share those results with you uh, and talk about them. Okay, so the first part, um, probably many people in the audience are familiar with rising declaratives. There's been a lot of work on this in the semantic pragmatic, semantics pragmatics literature recently. Um, but I'll just briefly remind you of the basic facts. So rising declaratives are not equivalent to falling declaratives, and they're also not equivalent to polar interrogatives in English. Um, they're, they're usually a special kind of question that requires the speaker to expect the addressee to commit to the content P of the declarative clause. So people have referred to this as sort of a contextual bias condition on rising declaratives. Um, and there are lots of different accounts of this available on the market. Just demonstrating this fact briefly. So first consider the context in six. Uh, so in this context, A is in her office and B has just arrived. In that kind of context, it's weird for A to just say, hey, it's raining with a declarative clause. Um, whereas the polar interrogative version would be perfectly acceptable. Hey, is it raining? Compare that to the context in seven. Uh, so in this context, A is in the office, B arrives, but this time B is holding a wet umbrella in a raincoat. Now it's perfectly felicitous for A to say, hey, it's raining. Uh, on the basis of the evidence in favor of that proposition that it's raining in the context and the expectation that B is um, going to commit to that proposition. So that's the basic uh, set of facts about rising declaratives and how they're different from polar interrogatives and also clearly different from falling declaratives and that it's used to ask a question. Um, and I will return to a couple more examples later on. Uh, on the intonational side, what we're looking at here is pitch tracks um, from two of the stimuli from the experiment I'm about to tell you about. Um, typically, rising declaratives in English have the same nuclear contour as um, polar questions, uh, the, well, polar in interrogatives in English. So this is like a, starts with a low pitch accent and then rises to a high final boundary tone. Um, in our experiment, we uh, tried to match the intonation used across our polar interrogative condition on the left and our rising declarative condition on the right as much as possible. One reason for that is we didn't want intonation um, to vary across those two conditions in the experiment as another source of variation um, besides you know, the, the syntactic variation here. Um, and the second reason is that there's work uh, in the literature suggesting that um, inquisitive uses of rising declaratives um, have the same intonation as polar interrogatives, they rise steeply to a high final boundary tone. Okay, last thing before telling you about how the experiment worked. Um, of course, in order for children to do this, they need to um, be exposed to rising declaratives in the input. So in some, uh, some corpus work done also here at the University of Maryland by um, Anissa Zaitsu, who is um, a PhD student at Stanford now, uh, her and her team looked at 15,000 adult utterances to children between one and three years old and annotated them for speech acting clause type. And I'm just gonna focus in on polar questions here. One finding was that the vast majority of polar questions in the input have rising intonation. A second finding um, is that a little under half of the polar questions in the input actually had subject ox inversion. So they were actually just genuine polar interrogative clauses. Um, and one takeaway already from this set of results is that um, you might think that intonation is sort of a stronger in indication to the child of polar questionhood than subject auxiliary inversion in English, just given um, the distribution in the input. Um, other facts, the child, uh, 
it, the input showed that 12% of the input was unambiguously um, rise in declaratives. So children are clearly exposed to, to actual rise in declaratives in the input. Um, and that's plenty of data to you know, notice it. Um, there's a further 15% of the input that's ambiguous between rise in declaratives and polar interrogatives for the left edge ellipsis. We can see a couple of examples in 10 and 11. Um, I'm not going to linger on this at the moment because this is going to come up again after talking about the experimental results. Um, but yeah, the point here is that um, you know there's further input here that could be rising declaratives, um, but there's also a further challenge due to this ambiguity. I'll come back to that. Okay, so about the experiment. Um, so we set up a natural game task in which the child in the experiment are Skype with a puppet named Boo Boo, and this is Boo Boo. Um, Whoops, sorry, just lost control of the slide there. There we go. Um, so in, in this game task, Boo Boo is making all kinds of utterances. Boo Boo's asserting things. Boo Boo's asking questions. Boo Boo's making requests. And the idea is that we observe the child's response to Boo Boo's utterances as a means to figure out how they're interpreting Boo Boo's utterances. And I'll explain the dependent variable is in just a second. Okay, so here's roughly what the child saw in the experiment. So um, the child sat to the left of the experimenter and in front of them was this game board with um, six places in a village. Um, so a gas station, a hospital, a fire station, and so on. And um, in, this con in this context, Boo Boo's job is to help all of these animals you can see on the right get to their workplaces in the village. And we explained to the child that it's very important that the animal goes to the correct workplace um, because uh, if they don't go to the right workplace, they won't know what to do once they get there. And that's a big problem. And Boo Boo could get in trouble for um, not getting the animals to the right workplace. So we try to raise the stakes enough so the child would care about where the animals go. And then what we do is we hand the child one animal at a time and we'd ask Boo Boo to tell us something about that child. Um, so for example, Boo Boo might say something like, put Panda Bear in the hospital. And assuming that the child understands an imperative clause, they should just go ahead and put panda bear in the hospital. Uh, we give the child another animal, and then Boo Boo says something else. Here, Boo Boo says, uh, sheep works at the gas station, so a falling declarative. If the child understands that as an assertion, given the context, they should use that information to then place sheep in the gas station. Um, and then Boo Boo says something else. So does froggy work at the gas station? So in this case, the child has now heard a genuine polar interrogative. Uh, and so when the child hears a question like this, um, what they're supposed to do then is ask to check what we call the book. And this is the last component of the experiment. Um, we have a book, which is a binder of information showing where each of the animals works. And the experimenter flips directly to the page for that relevant animal. And in this case, we see indeed Froggy works at the gas station. So we tell the child and then the child places Froggy in the gas station. Uh, and then the last condition here is the rising declarative condition. So Boo Boo says something like, Horsey works at the fire station. And then the question is, what is the child going to do in this situation? Um, right, and so the, the dependent variable here then is whether the child is upon hearing Boo Boo's utterance directly placing an animal in the village or uh, checking the book to get some information before doing that. Um, let me just give you a quick example of what this looked like. Great job. There's Rabbit. Can you hear? I realize when I share this, I maybe you can. Okay, good. Good job. Rabbit works at the hospital. Okay, so we'll stop there. So that's that's what the experiment looked like. Um, so here's our design. We had a training phase in which children uh, were exposed to imperatives, WH interrogatives, and polar interrogatives, and trained to place the animal directly in the imperative condition, but check the book in the WH interrogative and polar interrogative condition. By the end of training, um, they needed to uh, spontaneously um, place the animal correctly in the imperative condition and check the book in the interrogative conditions. 
in the test phase, um, the, there were four conditions, imperative, following declarative, polar and derogative, and rising declarative. And the expectation is the child would continue to place the animal for the imperative condition and also do so for the following declarative condition. But check the book for polar interrogatives. And then the question is, what do they do for rising declaratives? And we expect some uh, variation here. So here are some possible outcomes I'd like to outline, depending on what you might think the child knows. So um, the, the, the experiment is pitting declarative syntax against rising intonation. You could imagine that the children in this experiment had already acquired the link between following declaratives and assertions. And if they were to, to sort of blindly rely on just the syntactic information here, um, then when they hear a rising declarative, they should treat it like a following declarative and interpret it as an assertion and then directly place the animal in the village. On the other hand, um, given the input and, and also given the fact that rising intonation um, is typically correlated with polar questionhood cross-linguistically, it's not a cross-linguistic universal, but it's something that we observe in a lot of languages. Um, if the ch child has learned to associate this particular intonational contour with polar questionhood, and if they sort of blindly rely on the intonational cue, then when they hear a rising declarative, they should treat it like a polar interrogative and treat it as a question and then check the book. But then finally, another possibility is that, you know, they may have acquired that rising declaratives are, are special and that they're, they're not linked to assertions unlike uh, following declaratives. But they're also not really a normal kind of polar interrogative in English. Um, they're free, excuse me, frequently used to ask a question, but a special kind of bias question. Um, so in this experiment, we uh, ran 19 children between three and a half and four and a half years old. The average age was three years and uh, 11 months. Um, we also ran 16 adult controls. Uh, our target for, well, so let me say first, actually, so we, we also had 11 more children um, who failed the training phase in this experiment. So that's a lot of children uh, to fail the training phase. Let me tell you a couple of things about that. One is um, that those children were all on the, the younger end of the age spectrum. So they were an average of three or seven months old. Um, and we think that younger children just struggled with this task. Um, we did have a lot of younger children that passed the training as well. Um, and so the results that I'm gonna show you are for the children who are able to do this task. Um, and our goal ultimately was to collect um, 32 children total so that we would have 16 in each age group, three and a half to four and four to four and a half so that we could then compare younger children and older children and see if we're getting uh, a distinction between them. Unfortunately, we got to 19 children and then the pandemic hit. Um, and given that children, uh, some children struggled with this task, um, we uh, decided not to try to convert it to run on Zoom. Um, and so hopefully one day we will uh, collect the rest of this, this sample. Um, but so what we have instead is 19 children um, with an average age of, of three years, 11 months. Uh, let me show you the results. Um, so first looking at the adult results. Uh, so on the Y axis here, we're looking at the proportion of the time that adults check the book. And so we have a little visual reminder of the book up here versus directly placing the animal down here. And then on the X axis, we have the four conditions. And starting on the left, we see imperatives and following declaratives. Adults rarely check the book in this condition. They, they generally just place the animal directly into the village as expected. And then jumping over to the right-hand side, we see polar interrogatives. And adults always check the book when they heard a polar interrogative. And then in between, we see um, the rise in declaratives. And adults uh, um, check the book the majority of the time when hearing a uh, rise in declarative. Clearly, they're not interpreting it at all like a following declarative. And at the same time, they're not interpreting it as identical to uh, a polar interrogative. OK, so here's the child results. Um, the main takeaway here is that it patterns with the adult results. There's a little bit more noise, as is um, typical with acquisition experiments. Um, but looking at the imperative and following declarative condition, um, children rarely check the book. They, they tended to just place the animal in the village. And looking at the polar interrogative condition, they almost always check the book. And then in the rising declarative condition, they check the book, uh, 
the majority of the time. Uh, so clearly different than how they treated following declaratives, but at the same time, clearly different than how they treated um, polar interrogatives. Uh, so what can we conclude from this? So one thing we can conclude is that clearly for these children, rising declaratives are not equivalent to following declaratives, but also rising declaratives are not equivalent to polar interrogatives. So they're not, they're not just relying on the syntax. They're not just relying on the intonation. They seem to know something about rising declaratives as um, sort of a special means of asking a question. Um, so more similar to polar interrogatives, but still somewhat different. These are questions with a bias. Um, and we think that what participants, both adults and children in this experiment were doing is um, placing the animal based on, on that bias in some cases. So let me explain uh, why we think that would happen given the context in our experiment. So in order to use a rise in declarative, Boo Boo needs to expect the addressee to commit to that proposition P. And why would Boo Boo expect that in that context? To see why, consider um, this example uh, from a classic example from Poshman 2008 um, of a confirmative rise in declarative. So here the context is that we have a customer calling a travel agent and they say, I need to fly to Helsinki next Sunday. And the travel agent says, there's one flight at 11 and there's another at three. Uh, and the customer says, and the flight takes three hours, or sorry, and the flight takes about three hours. So using this rise in declarative, the cu customer conveys that they have a prior expectation themselves that, that proposition is true, but they're also trying to check and confirm it with the agent who has independent access to that information and who also is more of an expert on how long flights take. So this is a, a special case of a rise in declarative where um, the speaker of the rise in declarative has their own personal bias that that proposition is true. Um, that's not necessarily always the case with rise in declaratives. That's not a fundamental requirement of using a rise in declarative, um, but it is the case in certain contexts and that's the case here. Um, and then the main requirement that the address, that the speaker expects the addressee to commit to that proposition is clearly met in the context. So we think that the experimental context we had is, is really similar to that kind of example. So um, the participant has not done anything to imply to Boo Boo that they expect the proposition uh, denoted by the rise in declarative to be true. Um, so uh, it must be that Boo Boo is expecting that the book is going to reveal that that proposition is true based on um, a personal sort of shaky memory. Otherwise, the rise in declarative would be infelicitous. Um, so again, the idea is that, that Boo Boo has her own personal expectation um, and then wants to confirm that with someone who has access to information that is more reliable. So the conclusions for this experiment, um, do three-year-olds understand rise in declaratives? Yes, we, we think that uh, our results show that, that um, children exhibited subtle adult-like behavior with rise in declaratives between the age of three and a half and four and a half. Um, and they're not just relying on clause type, they're not just relying on intonation. And in terms of our overarching questions, when and how do children figure out the canonical speech act for each clause type? Um, well, the experimental results show that by this age, children clearly understand following declaratives as assertions and polar interrogatives as questions. We're not really surprised by that, but it's nice to have the experimental verification of it. Um, and then the second question, when and how do children figure out these canonical links can be violated? Um, so as far as the when part of that question goes, we think children by this age are figuring out this one type of uh, canonical link violation for rising declaratives. Um, <clears throat> okay, so just quickly, I wanna point out that um, sort of the thorniness of this problem. So recall the input. So um, uh, rising declaratives are felicitous in a particular kind of context and polar interrogatives are also felicitous in that context. But of course, polar interrogatives in English are felicitous in a larger range of contexts, right? This is just a particular subset. And the contexts that fall outside of the rise in declarative type context is one in which um, the speaker doesn't expect the addressee to commit to that proposition. Polar interrogatives are fine, their rise in declaratives are not. So the input sets up a kind of um, pragmatic subset problem. If the child were to incorrectly arrive at a grammar in which rise in declaratives were thought of as a standard means of asking a polar interrogative in English, uh, 
um, then they're never going to get exposed to any direct negative evidence that rising the curves are inappropriate in these kinds of contexts. Um, all, the most they'll get is sort of indirect negative evidence by rising declaratives not being used in these kinds of contexts. And what's tricky about the input here is, as I mentioned before, about 15% of it is ambiguous between rising clairs and polar interrogatives with left edge ellipsis, like the example I put here. You put Teddy in the toy chest. You can imagine this in a context where it's a rising declarative, the parent can't see where Teddy is and has some reason to expect that the child put Teddy in the toy chest, but it could also be used. Um, with just ellipsis, right? So the parent is saying, did you put Teddy in the toy chest, but just dropping the did. Um, there's a further part of the input here uh, that's unambiguously rising the curves, as I mentioned before, about 12% of it. And um, another 15% that are unambiguous left edge ellipsis polar interrogatives. Um, we think that probably the child is making use of those unambiguous cases to figure out the proper um, contextual restrictions on using rising declaratives as opposed to polar interrogatives in English. But the point here is just to, to point out um, that this is a thorny problem. The child needs to have to access to a lot of information already, information about what the proper, um, well, subject ox inversion, and then that left edge ellipsis is a thing, as well as the ability to um, fully understand the sorts of contextual restrictions um, that are in place when rising declaratives are used. Okay, uh, so I just have a few minutes left. Let me turn to the last part here and tell you about this ongoing experiment on younger children and whether they understand canonical links. So um, this is just a reminder that um, we're targeting this age range. And so what we're doing is we're testing children in the second year of life. We're starting with 18 and 24 month olds. And if the experimental uh, setup works with children of that age, we will then also test 12 month olds to see how they perform. So here's the basic setup. It's a preferential looking paradigm where the child is watching a video with two puppets and the context sets up the fact that one of those puppets is ignorant of some crucial information and the other puppet has some knowledge. And, uh, and then the puppets have a conversation. And the idea is um, if uh, participants are, are likely to look at people who they think are speaking the current utterance, then they'll look more at the ignorant puppet when hearing a question and more at the knowledgeable puppet when hearing an assertion. So in a little more detail, our independent variable here uh, is which type of utterance they hear first. Do they hear questions first? Like, is there a cookie in the box or do they hear assertions first? There's a cookie in the box. Um, and that's run between subjects. And the dependent variables preferential looking, again, the assumption you look more at the speaker during speech. And crucially, you can't tell who the speaker is from the visual scene, right? That's, that, that information can't be present in the visual scene. Uh, we have a training phase. So we have these two puppets on screen. There's a box in between them. And there's this mechanical arm that every now and then delivers a cookie into the box. And the puppets get very excited and one of the puppets eats the cookie. And then on some of the other training trials, um, the arm comes out with the cookie and they, they're happy to see that. And then the cookie doesn't get delivered. The arm retracts without dropping the cookie off in the box. And the puppets collectively say, oh, they're sad. OK, that's the setup. Uh, so there's these cookie deliveries. And the puppets want the cookies to get delivered, and they want to eat the cookies. OK, at pre-test, after this training phase, um, a phone rings. One of the puppets exits the screen to answer the phone. And the remaining puppet witnesses the cookie delivery. So they become the knowledgeable puppet. They understand. Uh, something that the other one doesn't know. So the phone answer returns and they're the ignorant puppet. And then at test, the puppets turn to each other, they have a conversation and you hear either a question or you hear an assertion. Um, so here's an example, uh, given that we're low on time, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna show you any of the training. I'm just going to skip to um, the pre-test and the test. So you can see what this looks like. Is there a cookie in the box? Is there a cookie? Is there? <laughs> <laughs> 
There is a cookie in the box. There is a cookie. There is. Yay! 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 Okay, so that's what the pretest and the test trial look like. As you could hear, um, the uh, utterances are each uttered three times with slight variations. Part of the reason for that is to extend the period of time in which one speaker is speaking and then another speaker is speaking to give us more of a chance to observe some looking behavior among the participants. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so far we have 18 participants. 10 of them are 18 month olds and eight of them are 24 month olds. Our target number is 40 children per age group. So we're only, a, we're not quite a, a quarter of the way there. Um, so like I said before, the results are preliminary. Let's go through a couple of possible predictions. So on the screen here, you can see one possible prediction. So on the Y axis, we are looking at the proportion of looks to ignorant puppets. On the X axis, we have time. Um, and we have reminders of, so the, um, uh, right, the ignorant puppet um, up here on the top and the knowledgeable puppet on the bottom. And in orange, we have um, the assertion first condition, in blue, the question first condition. And then the final thing to note here is that I've marked out at the top um, first utterance, second utterance, third utterance. So this is like, you know, is there a cookie in the box? That's the first utterance. Is there a cookie? Second utterance. Is there? Third utterance. Um, okay, and so here's what we expect. So at the beginning, before the child has heard any utterance, we expect all of them to look at the ignorant puppet. The reason for that is the ignorant puppet answered the phone, they come back on the screen, and that's when we start coding. So that's the most recent thing that happened, and so everyone's attention is like laser focused on the puppet that just came back. Um, and then they hear the first utterance, and that's I. So in the question condition, that's is there a cookie in the box? And the idea is that the child will keep looking at the ignorant puppet because they're the ones who are likely to be asking a question in that context. Now, suppose instead that they hear an assertion, there's a cookie in the box. The idea is that at that point, the child start, should start shifting their gaze to look at the knowledgeable puppet because they're the ones who have the information. And so they should be making an assertion. Um, and so this is one possible pattern then that the, the data, the looking pattern sort of split across the two conditions. That said, um, I did mention earlier that after hearing interrogatives, there's prior work showing that after hearing interrogatives, children tend to, um, at the end of the interrogative, shift their gaze to the other speaker, thinking that they're now gonna say something, there's gonna be a turn change. And so the looking pattern could wind up being more complicated here with sort of some back and forth looking, right? And um, what I, I point that out just to say, like, we're still figuring out, um, so we think those are the two most likely possibilities. Um, the, the key prediction for us is just that there's going to be a difference between um, the two conditions. Okay, so here's our preliminary results. Um, as you can see, they're patterning with um, the picture that I had on the previous slide. Um, so there's more looking to the ignorant puppet in the uh, question first condition. And in the assertion first condition, um, participants are changing their gaze to look to um, the uh, knowledgeable puppet. So we're really excited and, and encouraged uh, by this. Um, I, as I mentioned before, it's 18 participants. We need to get more participants and it's not like we have run any kind of statistics or anything on this. Um, uh, but right, so um, that's the, the sort of first step of this experiment. Um, and assuming that that uh, continues to work, the next step is going to be to run this with younger children, 12 month olds, um, to see whether they also already sort of display different looking behaviors across these conditions, or whether this is just too much for children at that age. Um, <clears throat> and then we plan to run follow-up versions of the experiment. So as you may have noticed in the first version, we're running, we're pitting polar interrogatives against falling declaratives. I should say rising polar interrogatives against falling declaratives. So they're, they're, there's a syntactic difference and an intonational difference. 
Um, in the second version, we'd like to run one with rise and declarative and following declarative. So then we'd be holding syntax constant and just uh, have an intonational distinction across the conditions. Um, in a third version, we'd like to take a look at WH interrogatives versus following declaratives where the intonation will be maximally similar, but the syntax will be different. And moreover, it adds in the complication of WH interrogative syntax as opposed to polar interrogative syntax. Um, and then in the final version, um, we'll look at, uh, we would like to look at French with younger children, the idea being that we can sort of fully extract any access to segmental information. So we were looking at English requiring children hearing French sentences. And so the, they would hear a familiar intonational distinction while not understanding the language. Okay, I just noticed the time and that I'm, I'm quite over. I see no one's sort of interrupted me. I am, this is the very last slide. So I'll just return to the two questions and say, um, so we suspect children are requiring canonical links around 12 to 18 months. Uh, we think that children acquire rise in declaratives or at least demonstrate knowledge of rise in declaratives um, by the time they're about three and a half to four and a half years old. There's still a lingering question here about how besides the bird's eye view I gave you earlier. And as I mentioned before, um, Yuan Yang, who's finishing up her PhD is someone who's working on this. And if we wanted to get into that at all in, at some point in the question answer period, I do have a few backup slides with some of her very interesting data as well. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, Krista. Thank you. Yes. So thank you so much. Um, first of all, I, I want to start by saying that um, I have really no comments about the actual experiments because they are clearly extremely well designed. And uh, I, I'm sure that you're going to, you know, once you actually get your hands on children, which seems to be the real problem here, um, you will get very, uh, very clear results. I think that um, they're pragmatically so well um so precisely um, uh, designed um, that you, you're bound to get what you want, and you know it would be very very nice to to hear um, you know the talk again, but with, with, with just more data um, at at some point. Um, I sort of stepped back back from you know the actual experiments because they are they are so good and uh, they are going to um, get us results. And try to sort of think of what's behind all this. And and you started with this slide where you, um, you know, had these these arrows going in sort of um, horizontal lines, which are the sort of can canonical mappings. And then you showed that there were all sorts of crisscross uh, mappings uh, that are that are possible in language, right? The, that was the slide with the little girl at at, at the bottom. I, I can't remember which one it was, but yeah, that's the one. So uh, so I was sort of thinking about it uh, from two points of view. Uh, one of which is that you, that you mentioned yourself, which is that polar interrogatives and WH inter interrogatives are both questions, but actually intonation wise, they often don't um, uh, match, right? So uh, in, in English, um, polar interrogatives, um, you said all the way through that they have a rising intonation. So First of all, I wanted to sort of um, point out that, that they do have, you know, it's always okay for them to have a rising intonation, but it, they absolutely don't have to have it. And in fact, in adult um, corpora, I think it's, it's, it's known that they often don't. So um, one of the issues that I wanted to uh, discuss is that in your uh, slides, when you discuss the um, the, cor the corpus uh, study of the of the in input to the children, you say that vast majority of the polar questions had uh, um, rising intonation. So I was wondering what that vast majority was, and if it's different from uh, uh, fifty percent, that would be very interesting because that would mean that the ch child directed speech is actually clearer than uh, than an, an a normal adult corpus would be, which would be a very good sign that something's going on there that the child is really using. Um, so that, that was sort of uh, one of the issues. Um, the other issues that I was wondering about is that um, this idea that polar questions are linked with rising intonation, um, you know, there's this idea that that's universal, that there's sort of a universal tendency. 
Uh, now that it's not it's not a universal. I, I I have come across work from not that you said that it was. It's just that there is this thing that um, some people sort of say it, and you know I've certainly come across that idea. Um, so there's work by uh, I think it's Andre Alain, perhaps uh, um, if I remember correctly, who who found you know many African languages, uh, I think Gur languages and Kwa languages that don't don't have that so uh it can't be universal but at the same time you know it could be sort of true a lot of the time so why 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 am i going on about this universal and i think it's important i think because what we do know about infants right really really tiny infants is that they start with intonation and in fact this is exactly the part of intonation that they start with right so um just to, to um to sort of uh, re recap that a little bit, uh, what infants know by um, say seven to 10 months is um, the prosodic grouping of, uh, of an intonational phrase. So something that uh, is exactly what a speech act would be in terms of uh, prosody, uh, an intonational phrase is something that helps them segment the speech stream into what we call clauses okay so you know as a syntactician you think the clause is, is the basic unit but really the basic unit for the child is the intonational phrase the, the intonational unit and that's what they map onto clauses and in fact they use the prosodic information about uh about the intonational phrase to then create syntactic units right so this is the the so-called um prosodic bootstrapping hypothesis so it's only a step from there to say that not only can children use the prosody to segment that thing, but then they could use the particular type of prosody on that intonational phrase arise at the end to actually select the type of speech act that that might be right that's that would be a very natural next step for the infant to take. And it's very tempting to think I think that this could be what's going on and that you know secondary uh, that syntactic information of what a, a question is. Uh, or what an interrog interrogative is, is maybe secondary in, in, in acquisition. So, you know, it would be prosody first and then syntax second. So that would be like one way of thinking about it. Uh, um, that would actually mean that, um, that, uh, that rising declaratives are not that hard. <laughs> because they are actually intonationally very well behaved, right? So you'd have to overlook the syntax in that case. Interestingly, we know from the focus literature that actually this is not likely to be the case, okay? So from the focus literature, what we know is that kids are often, even at this age, like three, four, even slightly older, uh, you can put them in situations where they are willing to overlook prosodic information um, in favor of formal syntactic uh, information or, or, you know, they resolve ambiguities in, in ways that sort of seemingly ignore prosody, not in all, all, all tasks, but, you know, there are many experiments that, that, that show that. There are experiments that show that they are sensitive to some of the prosodic differences. So what, what, you, what you can uh, sort of think is that that's a very different kind of prosody, it's pitch accents, you know, marking focus, focus. And this is really the, the, the prosody that you're using here is exactly the boundary tones that, uh, that, 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 that the child is really sensitive to when they're segmenting. Um, but I, I still sort of think that uh, it, uh, you also mentioned a lot of the, uh, 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 quite a lot of the literature showing that they are very sensitive to syntactic information. So I think it was, um, you, you cited this work with it, that they are sensitive to inversion between the subject and the auxiliary very early on. And that um, the work by uh, uh, Perkins and, and Lids, uh, where they show that uh, they can actually syntactically know that something's missing from a sentence and, 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 and track that information. So, my intuition is more that actually, interestingly, <laughs> it's it's not the prosody that drives this, it's more the syntax that drives this, okay? Um, and then the, the sort of the canonical, um, the canonical um, learning, you know, or the canonical association. And, and then I think 
you, you get some interesting, you know, whether it's the syntax or the prosody or, or they both contribute, there's interesting questions either way. So one of the questions that I thought we could uh, discuss is, uh, you know, would, would it be the case that certain languages then are easier to establish a canonical mapping, right? So in English, uh, for a canonical mapping for a polar question, you have the, the prosodic information and the syntactic information and they point in the same way, okay? Uh, but what if a language has only, um, you know, only prosodic information? You know, you could, you could now predict two different things. One is things you could predict is that in th that language, the child is, at a, dis at a disadvantage, you know, at a particular age group and they're very young because syntax does not support the prosody at, uh, in a language like that. But at the same time, you could say that in a language like that, the prosody will be a much more reliable cue because it's the only cue, right? So in English, precisely because both syntax and prosody marks a polar question, actually, the, the prosody queue is not is not that reliable, right? It's only it's only there in about half the time that somebody actually asks a polar question. So, um, you know, I think it sort of opens up this question of you, you were sort of saying, you know, these things help each other. Uh, I, I think it sort of opens up these questions of do they supplement each other in a way that when both are present, they can they can be less reliable cues, and then somehow they kind of act um, to, to play sort of play, play out to sort of support each other or are actually languages where um, where they uh, diverge maybe at a particular age easier in, in terms of establishing a canonical um, a canonical mapping and ultimately I think this work will be very interesting to sort of establish the role of prosody and the role of syntax in early acquisition, because we know that in the very early stages, prosody is crucial. We know that by the time they're three and four, syntax sometimes can have a prim primacy over, uh, over prosody, which is understandable, right? Because you can utter things with weird prosody and yet they still mean the same thing or often they mean the same thing, right? So, the question is, how does the child get from one 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 stage to the to, to the to the next stage? And I think there are the, the the results that you have are probing exactly the right the right questions there. I, I think I, I'm I'm my intuition is I still don't know whether they will go with the prosody or whether they will go with the syntax. You know, if I had to put my money on it, I'd probably put it on the syntax. But it could really go either way. Um, but I think exactly the questions that you're you're looking at are going to be. Uh, going to bring in very interesting information. So um, apart from this, I only had just one uh, small comment. I don't know if you want to react to that at all or um, about this pragmatic subset problem that you were um, saying at the end. To me, it didn't seem so severe. <laughs> I mean, I know subset problems are supposed to be sort of, uh, you know, uh, really driving, you know, like it's sort of the end of the conversation. If there's a subset problem, you, you can't go for the superset because you will never recover and all that. But I, I think um, I think that one one aspect that you can uh, definitely look at in this case is that the, the 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 specific meaning of the rising declarative is so specific and actually, you know, not that I'm a semanticist, but it seems quite compositionally related to the idea that it would sort of say, um, you know, to the, to the actual form of it. Uh, maybe you can just sort of learn the meaning that's associated with that specific form, and then um, and then there's no real subset problem, like other than the fact that it's a question or a polar question, but it's specific type. So, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't see that to be, you know, such an such an unsurmountable uh, issue. But that's just um, sort of a smaller comment. So really what I uh, wanted to um, sort of uh, mention is, you know, are you thinking of linking it back to this prosodic bootstrapping? Is there a sort of, is there a kind of design behind all this to sort of go back to, you know, how how infants really start with language and if it, and, and what your, you know, what your views on whether syntax wins out or prosody wins out or how, how, how does it work out if, um, you know, um, at, at, at that particular age, which is sort of the second year of life.